So I have a nice calm title today, Fast and Pray to Keep Demons Away. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm just quoting scripture. Yeah, I, I summarized it a little bit, but um, we're in the middle, well, not in the middle, I said that before, we're at the beginning of a 21-day fast as a church, and uh, I want to just underline the importance of prayer, period, but also the, the power of a 21-day fast that may be new for some of you, so... You know, we don't think you should just immediately stop eating and drinking for 40 days because that's in the Bible. You want to be careful about what you do. Check with your doctor on whatever the Lord shows you to do. But there's a, a real power in fasting that we'll talk about today. So I'm going to read from Matthew 17. And I also put a little subtitle in here, Deliver Us from Evil Unbelief. Because we all know the Our Father, well, I shouldn't say that. I'm guessing most of you know the Our Father prayer and says, deliver us from evil. And I think Jesus is helping us to focus on deliver us from the evil of unbelief because that's a stronghold in our lives that can stop the power of God. Somebody say amen. amen. It's a lack of faith. It's a lack of trust in God. That unbelief can have just as much strength as our faith if we're not careful. And we want our faith to conquer that stronghold of unbelief. So here it is, Matthew 17, 18, Jesus Jesus rebuked the demon, it came out of the child, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. So that's called a key to the kingdom. And if you need a little refresher on the scene that we're stepping in the middle of here, Jesus and uh, Peter and John were up on the mountain of transfiguration, the disciples that were still at the bottom of the mountain were confronted by Pharisees that brought this man with a demon-possessed child, and I believe it was a trap that the Pharisees set for the disciples because they knew Jesus wasn't there, and they wanted to discredit the, the apostles. So they didn't have Jesus with them, so the, 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 the Pharisees thought, this is a good chance for us to disprove them. So this man brings his child. He's hurting over the, over the condition of his child, similar to epileptic seizures the, man, the boy was having. And then Jesus comes down the mountain. And you could think about this because I'm guessing a lot of you know this portion of Scripture. And he said, how long will I be with you, you unbelieving generation? Remember that? I've only ever heard it taught that he was talking to his disciples, like he was rebuking them. Maybe not. Maybe he was talking to the Pharisees that came and tried to challenge the disciples. Uh, you can decide whether you want to look at that or not. You can look at it that way. It's not blasphemous to think that because Jesus is mentoring the disciples. And he doesn't use shame. All right? Just as a natural rule, he doesn't use shame. He coaches people into a better place. Right? And he had so much patience with them. It's not like he was having a bad day. Again, this is just my interpretation. Take it for what it's worth. But he comes down and he looks at the Pharisees and say, how long am I going to be with you, you unbelieving generation? I'm gone for a little while and you think you can come and discredit. No, the kingdom of God is here. And he rebukes this demon that's in this boy. And the boy is completely whole. whole. And naturally, the students come up to the master and they say, what were we missing? What's the problem? Anybody ever feel this way? Can we just be honest? Like we're reading the Bible and we're not seeing what we're reading. Is it us? Well, again, like if Jesus doesn't shame anybody, we shouldn't shame anybody. I mean, there was a time during the Word of Faith movement when it got a little bit rough because people were actually saying to somebody that would come up to, to get healed, you're sick because you want to be sick. Like, wait a minute, be careful. You know, like that's not what Kenneth Hagin taught when he brought this whole teaching about. Kenneth Hagin was healed himself. So he knew the power of prayer. But we don't shame people. We encourage them. We build their faith. And we help them demolish strongholds by studying the word of God. Renew your mind with the word of God. There's a billion distractions. But guess what? You can listen to the Bible all day long for free. Right on your phone. On YouTube. Just look it up. Old, New, Old Testament, New Testament, different different versions of it. I don't know, man. This morning, I just put it on when I got in my car. I was, I was up to the 70th Psalm by the time I finished breakfast. A better meal eating the Psalms. 
But just in your normal routine, let that be playing in the background. Not Howard Stern, you know. Like, he, he can represent every evil known to man, that guy. And he's a billionaire. Like, how did that happen? Because the world, you know, rejects Jesus and, and they love sin. Because they don't like those rules. They don't like the boundaries that the Lord asks us to do. So he says, because of your unbelief. And then he also says in verse 21, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. And, and a surface read would be this kind of demon that was in this little boy only comes out by prayer and fasting. But maybe he meant this kind of unbelief only comes out by prayer and fasting. And, and that's why the cover says, fast and pray to keep the demons away. Because he said it right there, this kind, whether it was the epileptic seizure or whether it was the unbelief in their heart, in some ways it doesn't matter. Fasting and praying keeps the demons awaying. <laughs> Got to make it rhyme because I'm a terrible rapper, right? Fast and pray. It'll keep the demons away. We have to just shut the door to, to the entry points where the devil tries to come in. And, and all I'm trying to do today is, is give us some more of these keys of the kingdom you can, you can think about it in the course of a year. If you went to every church service, assuming there's two services and there is, we have a, su a Sunday morning and a Wednesday night, that would be roughly 104, right? And not roughly, if you did it every 52 weeks, but you could take vacation. <laughs> so let's say it's 100 services a year. I go to 20 services or I go to 100 services. Is my spiritual condition likely to be better off here or here? It's not that hard. When you force yourself to go, even when you don't want to go, something good seems to always happen, right? I've, ha I've heard so many people say that over the years. Like, I didn't really want to go. I was having an argument with myself. That's always fun, having an argument with yourself. And uh, I ended up going, and boy, it was so good what you said. I just needed to hear that tonight. It's amazing how that happens, isn't it? Well, guess who wants you to stay home? It's not God. It's the enemy. So somehow by disciplining yourselves to be somewhat structured, not religious, hate the religious spirit. Jesus hated the religious spirit. But that's different than just understanding what's at stake. It's our spiritual condition. And lukewarm is not a good spiritual condition, is it? Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> so, couldn't cast them out because of my unbelief. This kind of unbelief or demon comes out through prayer and fasting. So Jesus is just underlining another key of the kingdom here is you better fast and pray. At some point in your life, prayer has to become important if you want to be effective for God. Or else, I can be, there was a song when I was newly saved, I don't want to be a carnal Christian. It was on uh, Christian radio at the time. And I said, oh, that's, that's a good way to say it. That I could be born again, but still be operating under the rulership of my flesh. Because it doesn't automatically just line up the day I become a Christian. My flesh doesn't want to listen, does it? So then he said in John chapter 4, verse 34, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Just hold up your keys, man. That's another one right there. You can get nourishment. You can get spiritual nourishment by doing the work the Lord has given you to do. I'm not getting a lot of amens here. He's trying to starve us. No, he's not trying to starve you. He's trying to say, you put on a couple pounds over the holidays, it's a good time. But the fast is not a diet. You just have enough in reserve, you're not going to die, okay? Take some, take some time off from the peanut butter and whatever. <laughs> Cookies, they're left over. I didn't want to throw them out. You know, they're left over. I love this. The disciples came. They said, aren't you hungry? He said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. And they think, somebody must have brought him a sandwich. <laughs> so they're just like us, right? Like, they're, they're just operating in this natural realm too. He's saying, no, when you're doing what God calls you to do, let's just think of a man in the Bible named Nehemiah. Remember him? Where did he work? Louder. He worked for the king. He lived in the palace. I mean, that's a pretty good job for a guy that came from... The, the beat up city of Jerusalem, right? They got taken over. And yet, the favor of the Lord allows him to be uh, a servant directly to the king. He was, he was the taster of the food in case anybody tried to poison the king. You better believe that guy prayed. 
He prayed over his food, right? So he's in the palace, and all of a sudden, guys come back that have visited. He said, my brother, and I don't know if it's his natural brother, but they come back from visiting Jerusalem. They tell him it's all burned down, and the city's in a terrible mess, and a burden of the Lord comes on him. That's not a bad thing. Because you need to be able to hear the voice of the Lord. And in a moment when he heard it, he says, I fasted and prayed and I wept for Jerusalem. Anybody ever had a burden for something in here? Like you know that your child is, is drifting and you, and you can't eat because you're wanting to fast and pray. Now that could become martyrish, right? We're not trying to be martyrs. But the Lord will say, I want you to focus on this. Break your normal routine right now because there's serious stuff going on. And I need you to focus and be, be prayed up. And... What Trisha and I found is that because we both heard the Lord say, I want you to go out and start that church, and we thought it was called Bernardsville at the time, tell you what we knew about anything. They say Bernardsville up here, but like we didn't even know it was in New Jersey. I lived here my whole life, never heard of Bernardsville, and uh, I wasn't that far away. I grew up in Union. But because we both knew the Lord told us to do it, whenever things got rough, you know, things can get rough in a church, you get sheep bites. <laughs> once in a while, and uh, you have to build an immune t immunity to those sheep bites, and, and it's not a vaccine, it's the Word of God. <laughs> you don't bite back, and people get discouraged in ministry, right? It's like, ah, oh, man, maybe we made a mistake, let's go somewhere else. No, no, 22 years later, we're here because we know God told us to be here, and if the other person... One of us is starting to drift. It's like, no, no, remember when we prayed. Remember how the Lord confirmed it to you that we were supposed to be here. And that's a burden in a good way. See, it's not a bad thing. The burden Nehemiah had carried him through the tough times when he shows up in Jerusalem and the enemies are, are coming against him. And, and, you know, they wanted to kill him. They were threatening him with death. But he knew the Lord told him to do it. And that's a great place to be. Fasting and praying will help you hear the voice of God more clearly. Verse 35 says, as you look around right now, would you say, again, now, the scene is Jesus is with the disciples. He had spoken to the woman at the well. She accepted him as Lord and went back into her town and told all the people of the town, if you watch The Chosen, that's a great episode. She goes back and tells the people, and then they come out, and, and the disciples come, and they're like, what's going on here? As you look around right now, look at all these people coming out of the town, Samaritans who the Jews hated. And they do a good job in The Chosen of showing you how much the disciples hated the Samaritans. As you look around right now, wouldn't you say that in about four months it will be harvest time? Well, I'm telling you to open your eyes. There's another key of the kingdom. When you fast and pray, your eyes get opened to things in the spirit that you might not have noticed in the natural. And look, I'm going to be real honest now because life is not easy. Living around this part of the world is not easy. The taxes never go down. Right? Like, it's way more expensive to live here and way, you know, go to other parts of the country. Or I've had clients, because again, what I do, you know, help people with their retirement plans and all. Nobody in the church, I don't ever mix that up, but they, they move to Delaware and they say they pay more, less tax in one year than they paid in one month living in New Jersey. Don't leave. Please don't leave because I told you that. <laughs> Trust God for more money. <laughs> Because if we take the easy way out, this place is never going to have that revival, right? We need people here that are ready. <laughs> when God told you to be there, you stay even when the taxes are high. Because where he guides, he provides. Yeah. So open your eyes, disciples. That's what he's saying. Open your eyes. It's not about the natural calendar that it's still four months until the harvest at the end of the summer. The harvest for souls is now. Look around you. Open your eyes. That's what fasting and prayer does. It, it takes you out of the lethargy. I don't know about you, but you know, if you eat a lot of carbs, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you start falling asleep at your desk. It's like, oh, I need coffee. No, that's, that's artificial energy. You might need it, but you know when, you, when you're in better shape, that doesn't happen because you're more alert, right? You have to be careful about all these inputs that come into your body because it, it, it affects the output. 
And he's saying fasting and prayer is, prayer is going to make you more alert to what's going on in the spirit. Open your eyes. Take a look at what's right in front of you. It's all these people following this woman, this good Samar the, the woman, the Samaritan woman that he met at the well. Right in front of you. These Samaritan fields are ripe. It's harvest time. Well, can I just ask you, church, has there ever been a more evident time of harvest than right now? Were there ever more hurting people in our culture than there are today? Today, January 2nd. Think about why. It's almost two years since the lockdown started. It's almost two years since we first heard about this uh, virus that was coming over. And they didn't lock us down until March, but we were hearing about it in January. In fact, Jen Ives, the lady that's going to be here soon, she spoke in January at our church, and she said, I sense the, the Lord telling me there's a lot of people here dealing with the spirit of death. If you want me to pray for you, the altar was full of people because it was already starting. And look, the Bible says that people all their lives contend with the torment of the, free, the fear of death. So that's, that just comes with the world's package that you get. We don't have to be afraid of death as Christians. Hallelujah. Somebody should shout about that. In fact, we're going to get new bodies. Hallelujah. That looks better to me every year that goes by. <laughs> Jesus goes into prayer in the garden, and he's real honest. Right? Like, it wasn't a lack of faith. He's just being honest. I accepted my commission from you. I accepted the assignment you gave me. If there's anything possible to let this cup pass from me, let that be, let that happen. Nevertheless, it's not about my will, it's about your will being done in my life. You know, and you ever saw, I quoted Braveheart not too long ago, and it's an amazing speech. I don't want to misquote it now, but that scene where he's riding back and forth in front of the, the pretty much just the regular guys that are there watching this big army coming at them, and he said, go ahead, you want to leave, go ahead. But just remember that 20 years from now, you might regret the fact that you had an opportunity for this whole country to be free and your children to be free, and you ran. And they went and they won the battle. But, but that's us every day, right? Like, we have to make these difficult choices every day if I'm going to take a stand for something or not. And it never really was this intense in the past as it is today. We have the answer, right? I mean, if anybody that you know is hurting, Jesus should be a clearer answer now than he ever has been. And people say, well, you know, I'm not an evangelist. That's not my gift. Well, it's one of the fivefold ministries to share your faith with other people. Let them know the reason for the hope that you have, right? Again, it's not to shame anybody. But if it's true that it's the best thing you ever did, how come you never talk about it? Maybe it wasn't the best thing you ever did. So as he's praying that, it says in verse 40, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. <laughs> Selah. <laughs> right? Like, does that ever happen? Snoring in the spirit and calling it prayer. <laughs> so that's Peter. You know, Peter's the one who said, I will die for you. And he couldn't even wait an hour praying for Jesus uh, when Jesus was facing that trial. But that's okay. Again, it's not a shaming thing. It's a, it's, it's a reminder that there's spiritual warfare going on all around us. And if we take this seriously, we don't mind the discipline the Lord gives us because we know we're more effective when we're, when we're operating in that space of fasting and prayer. So what I would tell you on the 21-day fast, the type of fast aside, it's less important to me about this topic, is keep a journal. As you're fasting and praying, keep a journal. And the Lord will show you things while you're praying. And it, sometimes it comes in just little bursts, little segments, clues. And he wants you to write it down. And then you go back and you reflect on it five days into the fast. And you start to see a trend over the things he's showing you that weren't clear when you just saw the one little thing. All right? And, and he will develop a theme for you for the whole year. Often this happens. What I want you to focus on this year. Awesome. Sign me up. He says, "What you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Here comes another one of those keys to the kingdom. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Please say amen. amen. 
Okay, so you know this is true, right? You know this is true. Willpower is not God power. <laughs> it's like a little dead battery, our willpower, compared to a nuclear fusion reactor over here, right? You don't have to ever do this with the battery. I don't think there's any juice left in this thing. God has plenty of juice left. Just tap into it. Nobody touch this. I licked it. I'll have to clean it off. I'm touching it. So and one of the things that he could reveal to you in your prayer while you're fasting and praying to start the year off here is signified in this picture that we use when, when we're teaching um, our course. This particular topic in possessing your vessel is called identifications of love. And if you could see it, it's a young crane, right? It's, it's a bird. And there's a man with a black hood on who's actually got good intentions. He wants to help this bird. But he's tricking the bird into thinking that his arm is a mother bird. And because the young crane is too young to understand what's going on, it's a counterfeit, but it looks real. And fasting and prayer will open our eyes to this happening in our lives. Because what? It says right there in John 88, Satan is a liar and the father of lies. So if ever there's a good counterfeiter, it's Satan. A million ways that he could lie to you. And he only has to win on a couple of those lies to get you to believe it. Because that's the only real power he has. He has no authority. Jesus has the authority. But the only power of Satan is lying. So if you have the truth, you're less likely to fall victim to his lies. But if you're part of a body of believers who are serious about serving God, that's another great part of your immune system. Because you've got people around you that you trust that you can ask a question. Right? And, and you can tell that the enemy's trying to get, get one over on you when they make you rush to make decisions. What's the rush? If it's a good deal today, it'll still be a good deal tomorrow. Oh, no. Bye now. Like, all right, well, you know what? I don't know. I don't think, I'm not saying you always have to do that, but it's one of those red flags. What, what's the rush? I want to pray about it. Even the world will say, give me a night to sleep on it. Well, that's a good way to say, I want to pray about it. I want to hear from the Lord. So this word imprinting is what they use to talk about how young kids, let's just use an example of inner city boys that are in a home with one parent and it's not the father. They'll go out into the culture and they don't feel safe because there's gangs. So what are you tempted to do? Join the gang. And you get imprinted into a gang mindset. You bought your safety to some degree, but it's not really that safe, is it? No, but you had to do what you had to do to, to get through. So you, you imprint to the wrong thing. If your parents, you know, I say this with fear and trembling, but if you grew up in a home with an alcoholic parent, one or both, very difficult, right? Very difficult. Because as a child, you need security and safety and, and some kind of routine to help you s straighten out how difficult it is to understand the world. But when you see inconsistent and violent and difficult behavior from one of the people that you're counting on, it cracks the foundation. That's another teaching called basic trust that we do here that we're happy to steer you to all of that. None of it is bigger than God. But it creates an issue that we have to deal with. And that's what I meant. You may have imprinted onto something. A woman who was raised by a father who physically abused her might date a guy that physically abuses her thinking that's love. No. That's not what the Word of God says. We love and respect one another. But because in that girl's development, that's what she saw from somebody who said loved her. Her friends are all going, what do you see in this guy? And she's like, oh, no, he loves me. No, he doesn't. That's the only grid she can see it through until God opens our eyes. And when God opens your eyes, like, oh, that was a counterfeit. I imprinted into something that was not life-giving. It was death-giving. And when the sun comes, he sets you free. Who the sun sets free is free. And, boy, we've gotten a lot of calls from angry husbands. And their wife wouldn't take it anymore. And she said, no, I don't have to take that from you. Who, what church are you going to? Come on down. 
Really, I, you know, I'm not sound like a hero, but that was part of the deal. Like, if you're going to sign up and try to help people, the people that are controlling them don't like it when they change. You're messing my girlfriend up. No, you're messing your girlfriend up. You need Jesus. Oh, I've got a couple of amens on that. Good. I'm um, coming down the home stretch. Thank you, Nate. John 10. At the top it says, My ear is tuned to the voice of the Lord. John 10, a lot of you know that's where he says, I've come to give you life more abundantly. But in verse 2 of that chapter, it says, He who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Excuse me. He goes before them, and the sheep follow him for, come on, what? They know his voice. How many of you know the voice of the Lord? How many of you would like to know it better? Right. Like even that still small voice, even that little prompting that you get sometimes that you blow by it. No, no. They know his voice. And then it says, yet yeah, they will by no means follow a stranger, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Another key. I'm giving you a whole ring of keys this morning for this prayer. What does that mean? Is that I don't feed my brain on Howard Stern. I'll just use him as a, a symbol of the devil. Hope he gets saved. But like all the junk that the world wants to feed you, all the shortcuts that is not, never farther away than your phone, and you know where your phone is all the time. And when you don't know where it is, you panic. That's right. Oh, man, it's the Bible on wheels. You can take it with you everywhere you go. It's worship music on wheels. You never have to carry, like back in the day, we would have to have the Walkman, and you had to have that whole pack of CDs in there. Like, no, God made it so easy for us. Feed your brain with the Word of God and with worship and good teaching. I heard there's churches that put good teachings up on YouTube. I think we're up to 500 videos on our YouTube channel. So feel free. Avail yourself. It's all free. We hear the voice of strangers, but we don't have to know the voice of strangers. See? Big difference. They know his voice. You're not going to be able to stop hearing the voice of the strangers, but you don't have to listen to them. That takes discipline. So I'm going to finish here in Acts 17. And it's an amazing scene. I mean, the whole book of Acts is an amazing book because, you know, you could argue in the, in the Gospels it's Jesus and he has an unfair advantage. You shouldn't think that way. He was all man, right? He was tempted to sin just like we are, so don't think he had this unfair advantage. He was tempted yet without sin. That sets the bar for us. If he did it and we have his spirit, we can live, that, we can live our lives that way. When we fall short, no shame, we repent. He forgives us, we move on. I'm a man after God's heart. Not perfectly serving him, but trying. Now, while Paul waited for them in Athens, again, sorry, I'm jumping in the middle, but the story is he's going from town to town throughout northern Greece, and, and there, it's riots everywhere he goes. And then suddenly a group of Jewish people start following him and, and telling the people, watch out for this guy, he's a renegade, you can't trust what he's saying. It was in Lystra, not too long before this, where they stoned him and dragged him out of the city, thinking him to be dead. Remember that? And it says the disciples came around him. I think they prayed over him and probably raised him from the dead. And he said, you know, I had a five-point message, but I was only on point two when they killed me. And he goes back in to finish the message. That's the kind of guy you want to follow. He goes back into the town. They just stoned him to death. That's courage. That's Christian. Christian and courage are supposed to go together, right? But here he is on the run again. He gets to Athens, and Athens is the big city where all the philosophers are. And he was waiting for them in Athens, and his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given to idols. So again, like I just talked about that. You go into New York, there's different neighborhoods have different idols, right? You could tell by the atmosphere there what the sin is. And it could be Wall Street. And look, that's to me that you couldn't be an amazing giver to the kingdom of God if you work on Wall Street. I know many of them that are that. 
So it's not Wall Street that's wrong, it's the spirit. It's the mammon spirit that tries to grip people and make them think money is their God. And boy, is that a good scheme of the enemy to lie to people, because you never win. No matter how much you have, there's always somebody with more. And you lose your family often and whatever. So he waits for them and is grieved in his spirit because of all the idols. I'm not technically savvy here. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. So here's Paul's strategy. Whenever I go into a new town, I'm going to find the most hostile people that don't want to hear what I'm going to say, and I'm going to start with them, the Jews. <laughs> Those are the ones that want to kill them. So like sometimes when they're, when they're talking about church planting, they'll do a survey, and they'll say, what town is more likely to, to be welcoming to a church? Like, okay, that's not what Paul did, right? Paul knew he was going to get opposition, but knew he had a better answer, and boom, he gets the confrontation, and now he's in a different place. He's in Athens. So it's, it's opposition, but it's a different spirit than the one he's used to. This is where Socrates and Plato, and really influence the whole world, still does influence the world, what those guys were talking about. And it's not all bad. You know, they talked about virtue, but nobody talked about humility as a virtue back then. I could tell you that one. So it only has to be a little different than Christianity for it to be not of the Lord, right? So say la on that one. So he reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews and the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace, because he was a tent maker, with those who happened to be there. And then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, what does this babbler want to say? Yeah, well, it's definitely not a compliment. And this is the picture that I got. I hope you guys are good with me up there, right? Okay, so... Like, this is how life is. You know, you're walking out and you step off the ledge. So this movie is called The Walk. And it was, it's a true story uh, about a French tightrope walker named Philippe Petit, I think it was. I'm sorry, I'm not pronouncing it right. He, before the, the World Trade Towers were over, but open, but while they were being built, he snuck up to the top with a couple of his friends. They shoot an arrow from one building to the other. They set the tightrope across and even had guide wires on it. Like, amazing. They got away with this. Completely illegal. And he goes out one morning, and you can see where he is. He's at the top of one of the old towers. And you can see the Brooklyn Bridge and the Manhattan Bridge. And this is like windy country, okay? If you've ever been to the tip of Manhattan, I worked there for a long time. It's always windy down there because you're right on the ocean, basically. And... Uh, He's going to walk across between the two towers on this tightrope. And he did it, by the way. It's an amazing movie. He was possessed by this idea. And I'm not commending that. I'm just saying this is how life feels for me sometimes. <laughs> that you're walking out on, on a ledge. And if I go too much this way or too much that way, it's curtains. <laughs> right? And you don't have a real playbook to use because you've never been in this situation before. We've never had a COVID lock. So now, like, what, what playbook am I going back to? Well, the, the Word of God, yes, but how do I interpret the Word for what I need right now? And then, you know, just to make it worse, they got to give you this shot. Like, oh, thanks. It wasn't bothering me enough when he was over here. Now he's out on the wire. And it's like, uh-oh, okay. So I'm being confronted about something with my boss, or another fellow worker, and what I say, either way, is really going to matter. And I want that narrow road that leads to life. But wide is the road that leads to destruction. Hey, welcome back. Good to see you. They went to North Dakota, South Dakota, South Dakota, and came back for the holidays. Oh, awesome. Good to see you. Now, he does this. He lays down on the wire halfway across. No, I'm sorry. That can't be true. Nobody would be that crazy to lay down on the wire and then you have to get up. I have a hard time getting out of bed sometimes and I'm on the ground. Like, all he has to do, he's got to hold this pole while he's getting himself up on the wire. Like, you, I couldn't have imagined in a million years that somebody could have done that. And then walks across, and he did it. It's a true story. And then he gets to the other side, and the cops are waiting for him. So what does he do? Turns around, 
goes back out the other way again. Because I'm finally feeling like, oh, thank God he made it. Like, I know he made it, but like, I'm like dying on the way across. You're going to turn around? No. I guess I need to get healing in that area. So they're calling Paul a babbler, and it was a really big insult to be call somebody that if you look into the language there. And then other guys said that he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the crucifixion. Oh, glad you're reading. It's not Jesus and the cross. It's Jesus and? Hmm. This is a pretty contentious thing, this resurrection. Dying on a cross, they knew about that one. Rising from the dead, that's another whole deal, isn't it? They brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak. And again, I won't go too deep into it, but the Areopagus was where they put people on trial. So there was already a crowd following Paul around saying, don't listen to this guy. This is not legit. So it's just as likely that he was on trial as it was that they were just curious about what he had to say because they didn't like people wanting to overthrow their government. And that's the charge of sedition. That's what they charged Jesus with, saying that he was a new king. He said, yeah, but I'm not trying to do some kind of hostile takeover here. It's the king of every individual heart. And the government of your life is on the shoulders of Jesus. And of the increase of his government and peace, come on, there is no end. You just keep allowing him to be the governor of your heart. So they're almost like mocking Paul saying, well, you got some secret thing. Are we allowed to know what you're talking about? Like, that would be Jersey City, right? Hoboken. For you're bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. And then Paul, again, now you have to just think about it for a minute. Did he know he was going to be here that morning? No. He didn't. So he's got to be living in real-time convergence with God. Fasting and prayer helps you do that. Denying your flesh and, and choosing the spiritual route will help you hear the voice of the Lord better because there's less clutter in your life. And you, and you start to see the counterfeits more easily. He's on that tightrope right now. He could easily offend them and get thrown out of the city or thrown in jail. I don't remember if it was Socrates or Plato, somebody might know here, that was put to death. Right? He was one of the greatest thinkers of all time. He got death penalty and accepted it. Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're very religious. He's not looking at his notes. Okay? I am looking at my notes because I'm not him. <laughs> but he doesn't have notes. He doesn't have a laptop. He's just operating in relationship with the Father and his understanding of the word and the revelation that he has. He says, I perceive that in all things you're very religious. For I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, and I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. How brilliant is that? How brilliant is it for him to take the situation he walks into and use what's right in front of him to make the point he wants to make? He didn't know that in advance. We don't have to know everything in advance, although we think we do, because I don't want to do something foolish, and I don't want you to do something foolish either. But if you think God's going to give you all the steps, you're probably in for a rude awakening. He's going to give you the next step. I'm looking at Cindy down there, and, you know, like, your testimony was amazing, and you may or may not know Cindy, but, like, it started out as a very important story to her, but it turned out becoming like nationally probably even further known, all because she took the steps the Lord was showing her along the way. There was no map. Never happened before. Couldn't have, couldn't know what to do in advance. But boy, when you're out on that tightrope and you get distracted, that wide road that leads to destruction, man, if your flesh gets in the way and it's not spirit-led, you know, I say it often, it could be a good idea and not a God idea. So Paul is in this high state of being alert to what the Spirit's saying. And he says, therefore, the one you worship without knowing, I'm telling you, I know that God. I know your unknown God. And this is so cool because this is a picture of, of where he would have been standing. They would have been looking up at that 
picture from where Paul was standing. He says, God who made the world and everything in it, since he's Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Like this, this takes a little chutzpah. It's like he's insulting them, like right in front of them, but he's just right on that line, right? He's just walking over there, and he's laying down on the thing, like, what? Laid down on the tightrope. I never even would have thought to do that. Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he give, gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he is made from one blood. Let me just look around this congregation right now for a minute. Isn't it beautiful to see ethnic diversity? Isn't it beautiful to be in a group of people that have the one thing in common, that we love Jesus, and we got the blood of Jesus, and we know his word, and the spirit of God, and it doesn't matter if you're black, white, yellow, whatever, like none of those things are important to God other than what's in your heart. They're important, I'm not denying it, but there can't be somebody at the door saying, no, you can't come in. Then it's not his church. Every nation to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times, the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord. I'm almost done. That's us, all right? And now, again, you might not feel like you're an evangelist or not, but the, one of the main ways people get saved is they look at your life and they see something about you that they like, and they're going to be curious, like, what is it about you that's different? And that's really good when that happens, right? Because it means you're integrating the word in the way you live and the decisions that you're making. And, and his presence is evident in your behavior, not just in the words you use, because they're sure looking to see if, you, if your walk matches your talk. So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they may grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. Can we stand? This is so key. He's not far from each of us. Not meaning to criticize any other teaching, but I don't agree that the only time it's going to be good for us as Christians is when we die and go to heaven. He wants, as it is in heaven, here on earth. He gives us new life now. Resurrection life now. Change nature now. Not, oh, it's going to be horrible until we die and go to heaven, but at least we'll make the cut. We could set our eyes much higher than that. For in him we live and move and have our being. Can we say that out loud together? In him we live and move and have our being. Start your fast on that verse right there, right? Like that salami sandwich I was going to have kind of pales in comparison. I could skip that one and live and move in, in the being of Jesus. That's how I live. That's my strength. And then he even, again, like Paul, while he's out on the, on the wire, he's like, oh, and by the way, don't you remember one of your own poets said, for we are also his offspring. So he's, he's knowledgeable enough in, in the, the understanding of the people he's talking to to use something that they can relate to. And we need to do the same thing and not come across like church lady when we're talking to people who don't know the Lord. Are you covered under the blood, brother? Like, the person going to get up and leave the table. I don't know what you're talking about. You're not in church. It's not King James English time. Just be real. And, you know, most of us probably remember some of the songs that we listened to before we were saved. They know those songs. You and Mrs. Jones got no thing going on. <laughs> you guys know that. That must have really hurt me, that song, because I quote it all the time. You got the wrong thing going on. Yeah. So since we're his offspring, we ought not to think that divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's ideas, imagination. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he's appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man, Jesus Christ, by the man whom he has ordained. He's given assurance to all of this by raising him from the dead. All right, so we started by saying this during worship. Can you put your hand on your heart now and, and just say, thank you, Lord, that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in me. Help me 
to yield to your rulership through your spirit and your word in my life. And you don't have to do the fast, but if you're going to do the fast, just say, help me, Lord, to live within the boundaries that you have set and to throttle my appetites so that I might hear your voice, understand your word, and get the revelation that I need to live a flourishing life here on the earth as a member of your kingdom. Amen. That's a good one. So skip a meal. However you decide to do it, that's a good thing to do. Skip a meal and eat the word while you're doing that and soak in worship and, and lift up your needs before the Lord and then just wait and listen and he'll drop things in your heart. And as you write them down, you're going to come up with a game plan. I'm just speaking that by faith over you right now. And, and for those that may not know the Lord that are here, I know people visit during the holidays. Uh, everybody that's a Christian here all made one common decision. We all turned from the life we were living and we came to Jesus and said, I'm willing to let you have a turn ruling my life. And that's what I said 39 years and one day ago. Uh, I, I said that prayer at the kitchen table in my house. And if you've never said that prayer, you don't have a lot to lose, right? Because if it doesn't work, you could just go back to what you're doing now. But I think a bunch of people in here would tell you, it really works. <laughs> it really works. Oh, yeah, but you don't know me, man. You don't know me. Yeah, well, I might not, but he does. And nobody's too far away from God that he can't reach down and pull you out of whatever pit life handed you. And that's the best option. So we all said a prayer similar to one I'm going to say. And if that's you and you don't know the Lord, you're just going to invite him in and say, I'm, I'm willing to give you a chance. One guy stopped at a bridge and he was going to jump off the bridge. He was ready to commit suicide. And he heard a voice say to him, you were ready to take your life. Would you be willing to give me your life? He said, that sounds like a pretty good trade. And uh, ended up becoming a full-time ministry person, helping people with depression, right? Because the thing that you overcome, God gives you authority in that area. So maybe you could just stretch your hands out and say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of your son, Jesus. I recognize there's sin in my life. And I feel the pain of bad choices. I haven't been able to stop on my own. So I'm asking you for help today. I want to turn from that way of living. I don't want to turn to your way of living. I don't think it's going to be easy. But I know it's right. So I'm asking you for help. To understand the Bible when I read it. To understand what you're showing me has to change. And to empower me with your Holy Spirit as my source of energy so that I can be obedient to what you tell me. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Help me grow in my knowledge of you and live an abundant life here and for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. So somebody might be feeling that there's a, a chord being struck in your heart, that that's true. And if that's you, we're going to have prayer people here at the altar. We would encourage you to come up and talk to somebody about it. Because as soon as you walk out the door, there's a billion distractions coming your way. But if you really feel like now's the time, take a step out of your seat, come up to the altar. Carol, Carolyn right here on the front row We'll be happy to meet you. And then the other prayer ministry, ministry team members are here. For those of you that have to go, I just bless you all. Remember, we have uh, fellowship in the, in the comments. And love to see you guys over there. If you need prayer, just come up the aisle where this guy with the yellow shirt is. And you'll be assigned to a team. Have an awesome day. We love you all very much. Happy New Year.